I was singing a song we haven't sung in a while. It's all about the Holy Spirit and what He does, how He works in us and is here, even now present with us. So we sing about Him. Good morning, Christ Church. How's everyone doing today? You guys can go ahead and be seated. Uh, my name's Flint. I'm new on staff here. I've only been here a few months. I moved to the Joplin area about seven years ago now to go to Ozark Christian College. While I was there, I met uh, my, my now wife, Sarah, uh, and we live in Webb City, and I got to join the staff here a few months ago. You guys might know me, though, from a previous life when I was a jazz musician. I went by the name Kenny G. <laughs> Just kidding. I'm not Kenny G, believe it or not. I do have a lot of hair, though. And I don't know if you guys have noticed, 
A lot of people who work here don't have a lot of hair. I'm hoping that's not contagious. Check back in a few months, we will see. I actually think maybe it helped in the interview process. They hired Spencer and they're like, we just gotta, we gotta get the equilibrium back. We gotta get some more hair on staff. Um, I can't tell you how excited I am that you're here though. I get to work with a lot of you guys' uh, kids and grandkids uh, with the fifth through eighth grade ministry on Wednesday nights and Sunday nights. And this church has just been so kind uh, to me since I got here and, and to my wife. And I'm so thankful for all of you. Uh, if you're new here today, if this is your first Sunday, uh, thanks for coming. We're really glad you're here. I understand how hard it can be to come to church. Uh, may, maybe you just moved to the area. Maybe you haven't been to the church in a long time. Uh, maybe you're a desperate Bengals fan and you're just looking for anything that's going to give you a little edge. Uh, why ever it is that you're here though, we're so glad you're, you're here and we want to welcome you here and we would love to get to know you uh, and get to put a, a name with your face. So we have a welcome center in the lobby. So after the service, if you are new, uh, stop by. We would love to get to know you. Um, if you're here today, maybe you've been coming to Christ Church and you're thinking, I would love a class where we really dive deep into what Christ Church is, what makes us us, uh, the heart of our culture, why we believe the things that we believe. Lucky for you, this is a great week because I'm announcing a, a class called Discover Christ Church or Discovering Christ Church in which we're going to do exactly that. Uh, we're going to dive into why we do the things that we do, why we believe the things that we do, and just who we are at a very um, deep level. Uh, level. And that's going to be offered two times next month. Uh, once is going to be two times on Sunday morning, split up uh, between those two weeks at the, during the 1045 service. And then on March 16th, uh, one Wednesday, the whole class. If you want more information on that, you can go to the website or you can find Crystal out in the lobby. Um, anyway, it's nice to meet you all. I'm really glad we're here. I'm very, very excited uh, for the service that we have in store. And again, just thanks. Thanks for coming to Christ Church. It's so great. Let's stand up as we keep singing this morning.
loves me. All I want is you, Jesus. All I want is you. Wherever you lead me, whatever it costs me, all I want is you, Jesus. All I want is you.
us in. And so, Lord, I just pray that your spirit would be at work even now, God, that we would have a desire to long after you, that we have a desire to be with you. And so this morning, I pray that we would get some sort of tangible sense of that, Lord, that we are with you and that you see us, God. We love you. It's your name we pray through the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. Church, you may be seated. In the uh, sermon series that we are about to start with the fifth through eighth graders, we're walking through some of the different names that God gives us for himself in the Old Testament and the stories that those names come from and what those tell us about who God is and about how he relates to his people. And I get to preach on one of my favorites, and that is El Roy. Not Old Roy, that's Walmart dog food. El Roy is a, a name from God that means the God who sees the God who sees me. And this comes from the story of Hagar. Um, Hagar was, if you don't know, the servant or one of the servants of Abraham and Sarah. And when Abraham stopped trusting that God was going to uh, provide the child that he had promised him, the son that he promised him, uh, he fathered a child with Hagar. Um, believe it or not, this caused a lot of problems, um, as one might expect looking from the outside. But the biggest problem was that Sarah became very jealous and bitter and mean and she started treating Hagar so poorly and eventually it got to a point where Hagar didn't even want to be there anymore she ran away she ran out into the desert um, she's all alone she's on the run she never had anyone in the world to begin with and now she's all alone and she's pregnant in the desert and she comes to this well and she's sitting there with no one to turn to and nowhere to go in the whole world and the angel of the Lord comes to her and and he sees her and he comforts her and he speaks a blessing over her unborn child. And then he tells her to go back to Abram and Sarah. And Hagar responds not in the way that you might expect, um, but instead she just simply sees, you are the God who sees me. Have I truly seen the one who sees me? And she goes back. I love this because it's a beautiful picture of one of my favorite themes from the Old Testament, which is this idea that we are God's, we're God's people. He's with us, he cares for us, he sees us, and so we don't have to fear. It's gonna be all right. Uh, God doesn't promise her that it's gonna get easier. In fact, he says, you know, you're gonna go back and it's not gonna be great. But Hagar knows that to be seen by God, to be loved by him, uh, to have God be with her is enough. And I don't think that there's a better picture of this, right, than Jesus and communion what we call here the table. And so hopefully you grabbed one of those little prepackaged cups of, of the bread and the juice, and we're moving into that time now as a church. And the story of Jesus is a story of God with us. Um, he's coming to live as a human. And now, as it's written in Hebrews, we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who's been tempted in every way, just as we are yet did not sin. And what a beautiful culmination this is to God seeing us, to knowing us, right? Not only does he see us in our suffering, which is enough, he cared so much that he gave his life as a ransom for us so that we could be with him forever. And that's what we celebrate now in the communion. In 1 Corinthians, Paul writes, in the same way after supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. So guys, just take this time to remember that you are known. Remember that God loves you, uh, that, that Jesus sees you, that he cares about you so much that he gave his life so that you could be with him forever. I'm gonna pray for us and then feel free to just uh, sit where you are and come to the table. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for being the God who sees us. Thanks for caring about us. 
Father, thank you for your son and for the life that he lived, the death that he died, um, and for his resurrection. It's in your great name we pray. Amen. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest therefore to send out workers into his harvest field. Go rather to the lost sheep of Israel as you go, proclaim this message. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Matthew chapter 9, verses 35 through 38, and Matthew chapter 10, verses 6 and 7. I was supposed to be out five seconds ago, so good morning, church. Good morning. Sorry about that, I got talking. Uh, if you'd open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 9, and uh, if you're new here, my name's Mark and I used to work here often. <laughs> hey, I want to address Flint for a second, you know, Kenny G. Uh, I want to tell you what my grandfather, who I inherited his hairline from once said, he said, uh, it's tough to keep paint on the hood of a car whose engine runs hot, so you just read into that however you want, okay? <clears throat> These kids trying to take on the veteran. All right, so if you are visiting here, uh, our theme is Kingdom Come, and we're looking at the book of Matthew, the gospel message of Matthew. And what we're realizing is Matthew does something where we're at in the text today that I want you to notice. It's not even subtle. It's a change in the direction he takes us in the gospel. What he does in the first nine chapters for the foremost is he establishes who Jesus is. So let's just talk briefly through what we've learned in the first nine chapters. We've learned that Jesus is a king unlike any other king, a promised king, a king from the line of David, the Messiah, the one who's promised, not just a king, the messianic king. We've learned that he's a deliverer of those enslaved by sin. We've learned that he's a judge who will judge every man and woman and nothing will be kept secret from him because he knows everything we've done, everything we've thought and why we've done it all. He's a just judge, he's a deliverer, he's a king, he's an obedient son who showed us how to withstand temptation by faith, trusting in the words of God and who God is. He has authoritative words and he has authoritative actions. 
If you read, like I asked you to this week, if you read Matthew 8 and 9 and spent some time in it, you'll see that there were nine miracles performed in these two chapters. The authority of Jesus is displayed as he shows who he is by taking over all that was broken by sin. And this awareness changes us. You see, Matthew is going to now go from who Jesus is to what he desires of us. He's introduced it in the new kingdom in the Sermon on the Mount. But what he desires of us is more. He's desiring allegiance. In fact, he's requesting allegiance. Don't be mistaken. Jesus has drawn that proverbial line in the cement. And the line is not going to change. And he's asking us to cross over that because of who he is and live in his new kingdom under his authority, under his kindness. And when we, when we think about this, he's, because he's revealing himself to us, we have to respond to that. He's not just anybody. He's the son of the living God, creator of the universe. All authority is his. And he calls us to action. Matthew chapter 9, verse 35 and 36. This is a summary of what Matthew's been telling us so far in chapters 8 and 9. Jesus went through all the towns and villages teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. I want to talk to you about life outside the kingdom. I want you to notice something about this king that's being revealed. You see, this is our origin story. It's all of our origin stories. Whether you're a believer or you're not a believer here today, whether you're at home and you're just trying to figure this out and you're, you're testing everything, we're glad you're with us, whether you're here or at home. But if you're a believer, this works for us too. It's the origin story of every single person. We were outside of the kingdom because of our rebellion. It wasn't because of a mistake or an accident. Dismiss all of those. We've made choices in our life to say to God, you don't get to rule me. You don't get to tell me what to do. And that, by definition, is sin, because we don't believe that God is good or we don't believe that God is wise. We've made choices that rebelled against him. Maybe it paid off. Most don't. And in that moment, we were outside of the kingdom. But I want you to see a picture that Matthew paints of Jesus, a distinct picture that helps us understand what we were before him and what those around us who don't have him are. Jesus sees us. It may seem like a minor point, but it's not a minor point. In those verses, we realize, it says that Jesus saw the crowds. That's not insignificant. Yeah, he saw a mass of people, but he knew who they were. He knew them by name. The scriptures teach that when you were conceived, when the sperm hit the egg, God knew you. He knew what you were created for. It says that your name is written on the palm of his hand. God is not unobservant. God is not disinterested and disconnected. Jesus saw the crowds and he saw people. Yes, he saw a crowd, but he saw the people in the crowd too. He saw the many, many faces, the many, many stories, the many, many needs. And it says he was moved with compassion. The, the word there, like Jesus, this is written in Greek. It, it's a very specific language for the most part. And they used it to communicate these truths. So Matthew would have written this in Greek to communicate to the largest audience. But it says that Jesus was moved. The word that he chose from the Greek that we translate compassion actually means what would make my grandmother be mad at me and my mother roll her eyes. It moved him in his guts. I can hear my grandma. That's locker room talk. Have you ever been moved in your gut? Like not just, it's a visceral response to a need. It says that when Jesus saw the crowds, he was moved with compassion. It moved him. I hope this isn't self-serving. But every time I think of the word compassion and I think of moving the gut, I couldn't do this until just a few years ago. Our youngest son, Braden, was about six or seven years of age. We were swimming in our backyard at our, in our pool. Now, because I am pasty white, all I do is burn. So I was sitting in the shade. Alex and his older friends, Alex is 10 years older than our youngest son, Braden, and he had a bunch of his buddies over, high school friends, and they were jumping off the diving board and doing backflips and doing crazy things, competing at everything they did. And here's six or seven-year-old Braden who wanted so much to be with the big boys, and I get that. I wanted him to be with, they were good guys. I wanted him to hang out with them and see how, how boys act when they're supposed to act right. But Braden had a fear of water. There's nothing to be embarrassed about that. Heather and I, my wife and I, were both lifeguards growing up. She lifeguarded at her church camp. I lifeguarded at mine. I've taught hundreds of people to swim. 
I actually had to get in the water and help some people who needed rescued in whatever form and manner that is. So I have a lot of experience. Do y'all think that Heather and I could teach Braden to swim? Nope. <laughs> Feed him, care for him, provide for him, protect him. Didn't trust me in the water. So we hired Mr. Dave McCulley, came over from the neighborhood and taught him to swim in about a day. Drove me crazy. <laughs> but previous to that, Braden would get in the water and he would never, I mean, the kid's neck would grow 19 inches if his face was close to getting wet. He was part turtle. And he was in the water one particular day and the boys were there and he wanted so much to be with them that he took a risk. And he started to waddle out the shallow end, neck high, chin up, face never wet. And he got to a certain point in our pool because he'd never been there before. He didn't understand the slope. And I'm watching him do this and I'm proud of him. Like, go buddy, get out there, you can swim. And he took a step. Now I'm not gonna exaggerate this. I'm just gonna explain what I saw. When he took a step, his feet went out from under him and he started going toward the deep end. He turned toward the wall and I could see his face. It wasn't fear, it was resignation. He was, he was scared, yeah. But here's what I saw in his face. I've known him his whole life. I know his expressions. His expression was, oh no, I can't get back. It, was, it had dawned on him, he'd gone too far and he couldn't swim, and he was too far away from the wall. So I'm not a superhero, but it took me about three steps to get from where I was into the water. And I jumped in the water, and I reached my arm underneath him, and I pulled him back toward me. And then I knew all the boys were looking at why, you know, the, well, A, I should never have my shirt off, and B, I'm in the water. <laughs> so there was a bit of horror mixed with wonder, right? <laughs> and I grabbed him, and I pulled him over, and I decided in that moment, I don't want to embarrass him. So I'm gonna act like I'm just roughing him up and throwing him around like I always did. And he grabbed me like a spider monkey. And he was held on for dear life and he whispered in my ear, thanks dad. <laughs> he knew he had gone too far and couldn't get back. I knew he'd gone far and, to, and I never ever wanna see that look on his face. Why do I tell you that? I was moved in my gut. It wasn't logical. I had compassion for my son because I realized he couldn't help himself where he was. He was, something good wasn't gonna happen. Is that the Jesus you see? Because that's what Matthew wants you to see. A Jesus who sees you in whatever condition you're in and instead of sitting there going, serves him right, idiot. The world paints Jesus as some ogre who doesn't care. Matthew's showing us who he is. He sees the crowd. He's moved with compassion. It even suggests that he feels our suffering. It says that he sees them, that they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. I have talked extensively on this stage. So if you've attended here at all, you know that that's not a compliment to be called sheep. They're defenseless. They're ignorant. They're stinky. If someone's not protecting them, they're soon to die. And Jesus looks out and he doesn't see the crowd and he's not sitting there hating them. He's actually looking at them and understanding that without Me, Jesus is thinking. His compassion comes from, if I don't get in and pull them to safety, they are not going to make it. It's a pretty powerful image. In a world that is so messed up by sin, not by mistakes, by sin, we think one more drink, one more high, one more promotion, one more sexual encounter, a bigger truck, a new home, a promotion, This will fill my heart. This will make me happy. This will give me a place. It won't. Those are sheep without shepherds. They don't have anybody to guide them into green pastures and still waters and rest for their soul. Jesus knows this. He also knows our separation. In verse 37, it says, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. I can't say it's every time, but I can say it's most of the time that the term harvesting is used at all in scripture, it's about judgment. It's about the day in which God, the great judge, will set everything right. Jesus is suggesting when he looks out to his disciples, he says to them, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. He's saying the judgment of God is coming. And Jesus isn't saying this with great glee. He's not looking forward to this day. He's actually saying there is an opportunity in front of all of us right now to keep people from entering into the harsh judgment and instead enter into the kingdom. Are you with me? This is our Jesus. Please don't forget it. Because remember what 
What invites you into the kingdom is what will keep you in the kingdom. And the goodness of our king is displayed here. In two weeks, we're going to talk in Matthew chapter 13 about judgment and how Jesus addresses this. But please understand, he is already showing us the urgency. He sees us. He knows we're suffering. He knows we're scattered and helpless. And he knows that many are separated from the goodness of the kingdom of heaven. And he's not pleased with this. He's not angry. He's moved in his gut with compassion. And here's the beauty. Not only does he just see us, feel us, and recognize us, he came to remedy all of this. He came to be the solution to the shepherdless sheep. So how does he call his kingdom followers? Those of us who have placed ourselves as those following Jesus, disciples of his. What is his call? His call is to allegiance. Again, Matthew makes the flip from telling us who he is to reminding us who this man is that's calling us and what he's asking us to do. Jesus would say later that if you love me, you will what? Keep my commandments. Allegiance is not optional in discipleship. It's optional in American Christianity. I'll let Jesus save me, but the lordship of Jesus, uh, we'll work on that. No, he can't, he can't be your savior if he's not your Lord, and he can't be your Lord if he's not your savior. Jesus gets to dictate the terms, amen? amen. And, and we can trust him because he's good, and he's kind, and he's beautiful, and he's powerful, and he has all authority, and he's using his authority to bless us, not crush us. But he's calling for allegiance. So let me tell you the simple truth of what I want you to hear over and over this morning. Our love of Jesus compels us in ways that duty never will. The love of Jesus will draw allegiance out of you in a way that duty never can. It is not do I have to. It is rather I get to because of what he's done for me. First thing Jesus does is he challenges us to pray. Look at verse 37 and 8. Jesus said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. I want to be very practical today. Jesus is not saying, prepare yourself, for in 12 months the harvest is coming. He says, no, the harvest is now. There's opportunities now. Go and preach this word. The kingdom of heaven is available when? Now. Now. It's not a one day I get to go to heaven. It's a right now there are opportunities to advance the kingdom of heaven because our love for God will compel us in ways that duty never will. It's not a one day thing. It's a right now thing. And he says to pray. Remember what we learned a few weeks ago in Matthew chapter six in the Sermon on the Mount when we talked about the Lord's Prayer. Jesus doesn't tell us what to pray. He tells us how to pray. And he tells us how to pray. He says, pray for God's honor. Pray for God's kingdom. Pray for God's will. It sounds like this. Holy is your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done, church, on earth as it is in heaven. May God get what God wants by the way we live our lives. May we bring his will, his honor, and his kingdom into play. Can I put it simply this way? If you're a part of his kingdom, he's called you to pray. And please understand this. You yourself are the answer to the prayer. Because the prayer is, who will go into my world and harvest those that will receive my kingdom? And we are the answer to that prayer. So the opportunities are not only to pray, but there are opportunities for Jesus' followers daily, this day included. Verses 5, 6, and 7. These 12 Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Do not go among the Gentiles or enter any town of the Samaritans. Go rather to the lost sheep of Israel. As you go, proclaim this message. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Go. Not eventually. My understanding of the original language is it could probably best be interpreted along these lines. As you are going. When we hear this, everybody thinks, oh, the preacher's going to want to send 92 of us over to China. No, no, God does the sending. But I want you to know this. As you go, you can fulfill God's desire for you in every intersection you have. And here's the beauty of God's plan. He actually knows what he's doing. Because you're going to go into intersections with people every week that I will never meet in my lifetime. 
And I'm going to go to places and have conversations with people at work, among my friend groups, with my family, and people I encounter in the uh, community, whether it's coaching Little League or having interactions with people. The beauty of all of this is you and I are going to go together and to different places and have opportunities to spread the kingdom to different people. Don't look at the entire world and say, how am I going to share it with all of them? Share it with the ones you already have contact with. Love the crowd you're in. See the crowd you're in. Notice their suffering. Notice their separation. You're the answer to the prayer. But preacher, I don't know enough. You're right. I'm going to say the wrong things. I do. Sometimes I'm not going to know what to say every week of my life. You know, the truth of it all is, God knew that when he asked you to do it. He just asks you to do it. It's not duty. It's the love of God. He tells us to go into need. Verse 8, heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. And we're like, what, what, what? Preacher, I can't heal the sick and raise the dead, and I don't, I've never met a leper. What Jesus is doing is he's just recapitulating everything they've seen him do in chapters 8 and 9. Do you notice this? Everything that he did, he's saying to them, I will give you my authority to bring the kingdom to light. And maybe he's not asking us in 2022 to go out and find lepers and heal them. But if he gave us that authority, it would work. What he's actually asking us to do is to demonstrate the kingdom. And, and verse 8 is so crucial. Freely you have received, freely give. Give what you've received. Have you received grace and kindness? Have you received forgiveness and peace? Has your past been taken from you and placed on Jesus on the cross and your sins have been forgiven? You can give that away. But you have to go and talk with people who are suffering and shepherdless and offer them what you were given in the same condition. It's not as difficult as we make it. And so don't even think about the ones you don't know. Think about the people you do know. God might move you in compassion because here's what I believe, and I don't want to stretch the illustration too emotionally too far, but how many people do you see every day who have the look that my youngest son had on his face that moment where it was, oh no, I've gone too far. Those are the people that we invite into the kingdom. Those are the people who need to know that there's a hope that's not going to be fixed by one more drink, one more act of sex, one more promotion, a bigger pickup truck, a new place to live, a summer home. Those are the people who don't care about any of those things because they've gone too far and they can't get back. Verse 8, freely you have received, freely give. Do not get any gold or silver or copper to take with you in your belts. No bag for the journey or extra shirt or sandals or a staff for the worker is worth his keep. I think contextually, this is what Jesus is saying to the 12. Give up all the excuses of how you're not ready. Just go because I'm going with you and I will be enough. Jesus said, you can have a million reasons why we can't do this. But the truth is you can because God said, I'm going to send you into the places you're already at. Don't worry about anything. I'm going to provide. He was teaching the disciples he is faithful. And he will teach us the same thing if we trust. Verse 10, for the worker is worth his keep. I want to spend just a moment on this. I want you to know that Jesus saw you in the crowd before you called him yours. He knew your name before you knew his. He, he was there for you. The same God that was there before you were part of his kingdom, do you think he's going to abandon you while you're in his kingdom? That's why he said to his disciples, a worker is worthy of his, of his wage. I'm going to take care of you. If you're serving me, I will continue to serve you. So we go into needs. We look for those people who are like, oh, no. And we also go into risk. This is where our allegiance is most tested. Verse 11, whatever town or village you enter, search there for some worthy person and stay at their house until you leave. As you enter the home, give it your greeting. If the home is deserving, let your peace rest on it. If it is not, let your peace return to you. If anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, leave that home or town and shake the dust off your feet. Truly, I tell you, it'll be more bearable for Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than for that town. Now he says to his disciples this, it's a hard teaching. Rejection is conceivable. Jesus will go on to say later, they hated me, they're going to hate you. 
Our allegiance is not to our comfort. Our allegiance is not to God fitting into our lives comfortably so that it doesn't cost us anything. Jesus said, no, to do what I'm asking you to do may cause some of you to get rejected, for some of you to be ignored, for some of you to lose friendships, for some of you to take the risk to love someone enough to care for them may cost you what you think you most need. Verse 16, I am sending you out like sheep among wolves. Therefore, be as shrewd as snakes and innocent as doves. Jesus, don't be foolish. Cast the seed, but, but be wise. Pay attention to the conditions. Notice around you, there are moments in which to be bold and there's moments to be gentle. There are moments to give straight, unfiltered truth and there's moments to offer it with grace in bite-sized pieces. Jesus said, use your head, but speak. Cast the seed. I think of the parable of the soil and the sower throwing the seeds out. According to him, only 25% of it ever takes. Our job is not to decide what the soil looks like. Our job is to what? Cast the truth, offer the kingdom, introduce Jesus. Verse 17, be on your guard. You will be handed over to the local councils and be flogged in the synagogues. On my account, you'll be brought before governors and kings as witnesses to them and to the Gentiles. But when they arrest you, do not worry about what to say or how to say it. At that time, you will be given what to say, for it will not be you speaking, but the spirit of your father speaking through you. If you're taking notes, I'd love for you to write down Acts chapter three and four. If you want to read how this is prophetic, read what happened in Acts 3 and 4, and you're going to see moments where these untrained, uneducated men stood up and spoke on behalf of God. Acts chapter 2 could be included. Peter's great sermon on the day of Pentecost. That Jesus said, no, God is not going to abandon you. If you take the risk for me, I will be there. And I will speak through you. Remember these men that ran away and hid from Jesus on the night he was arrested? In the book of Acts, they're brought before the same people that sent Jesus to his death. They stood before them and they said, if you keep preaching this Jesus, we're gonna do to you what we did to him. And they kept preaching it. And I love Peter who ran away the night Jesus was arrested. Peter looked these men in the eyes and he said, whatever that means to you is fine. We're gonna preach Jesus. And they were beaten and persecuted for standing up and proclaiming the gospel message that Jesus is the hope of the world. And then when they were beaten, instead of fearing and running away, they got together in the book of Acts, they got together in a room and they celebrated that they would be found worthy enough to suffer for the kingdom. Let's not pretend. Jesus is calling us to a tough act, but he's not calling us alone. See, God is not distracted or disconnected. The same God who noticed you in the crowd is the same God who will be with you in the crowd. Verse 21, brother will betray brother to death and father his child. Children will rebel against their parents and have them put to death. You will be hated by everyone because of me, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. When you are persecuted in one place, flee to another. Truly, I tell you, you will not finish going through the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. He's talking about the great moment when he is revealed on the cross and through the resurrection. And he's telling them, yes, there will be discomfort, fear, and danger, but I will be with you. Verse 22, think about it with me. But the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. The love of Christ will compel you to do things that duty never can. So in those moments of uh, suffering and struggling, what do we fix our mind on? Who Jesus is and the hope that it brings us. Verse 24, the student is not above the teacher, nor a servant above his master. It is enough for students to be like their teachers and servants like their masters. If the head of the house has be called Beelzebub, how much more the members of his household? So do not be afraid of them, for there is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed or hidden that will not be made known. What I tell you in the dark, speak in the daylight. What is whispered in your ear, proclaim from the roof. Do not be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Jesus is not sending us out into a rough world as to make us pay a penance for our rebellion. He's sending us out as people jumping into the waters to pull back those who desire to be in his kingdom, to offer them the same grace and mercy that he offered us. Because the risks of the kingdom are worth the redemption found in the kingdom. To give up our lives for a friend is true love. To risk our comfort and our possessions. That's why three times in verses 26, 7, and 8, Jesus says to us, do not be afraid. 
And the only time you have to tell someone not to be afraid is when there's a reason to be afraid. So Jesus is not dismissing this as it's not a big ask. He says it is a big ask and it produces incredible rewards to the glory and will of God. Verse 32. Whoever acknowledges me before others, I will also acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But whoever disowns me before others, I will disown before my Father in heaven. It's a big statement. But people who don't really believe that Jesus is the answer will never tell anybody else that Jesus is the answer. People who don't believe that Jesus is real would never tell anybody else that Jesus is real. And people who have never felt the love of Jesus are probably never gonna tell anybody else about the love of Jesus. The love of Christ compels us where duty cannot. So we need to ask our hearts today, is the Jesus revealed to the power of the cross, the resurrection, to the incarnation, walking among men, sacrificing his comfort and his beauty to show us who he is so that he can be revealed, who sits down at the right hand of the Father accomplishing everything God asked him to accomplish and will return one day as rightful victor over all of the world and he will set everything right. Is he worth the sacrifices of caring for others? Yes. Yes. But many of us won't be motivated by that until we understand deeply how much he's cared for us, which is why we open the Bible. It's why we journey this together. Verse 38 is a powerful verse. Whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. So I'll say this to those of you at home watching and those of you in the room here today. If you have never laid your life down at the feet of Jesus and given yourself to him and made him your Lord as he becomes your savior, if you've never done this, listen to this verse. That if you don't, if you don't take the sacrifice to to give your life to him because you love him and trust him, Jesus said, you won't be a part of my kingdom. It's not a man-made rule. It's what Jesus calls us to as we end our lives and place it solely in him. Verse 39 is for those of us who have already made a profession of faith. Whoever finds their life will lose it. Whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. The more we follow Jesus, the more we disappear into the history of all time and we become like him. This is why we believe that the purpose of the church is to help all of God's people find their completeness in Jesus. And when we find our completeness in Jesus, we stop trying to find our completeness in ourselves. We die to self that we might live for him because the love of Jesus compels us in ways that duty never will. There are tables in the back of the room that have lamps lit on those and some people are heading back there right now. If today's the day that you wanna lay down your life and accept Jesus' life for yours, when you want to give your allegiance to him and tell the world, I want to be a disciple of Jesus because of what he's done for me. And you want to begin that journey? We would love to have a conversation with you. We're not going to ask you to do anything, but we will walk with you and talk with you and show you what Jesus asks and give you a reason why it's worth doing. Or maybe you need to be prayed with or encouraged, or maybe you want to know what the next steps of your discipleship are. You're on the pathway of following Jesus and you want to know how you can focus your attention and walk the walk. We love to journey. This is what the church is for. You can do this in the next few moments as we sing a song here in just a moment or at the end of service, we'll be there for you. But I also want to encourage you, in the next few moments, we're going to pray two prayers. They're going to appear on the screen. I invite you to spend some moments reflecting on these two prayers because the man Jesus, the one we've seen revealed, is inviting you into his kingdom to share it with others for the glory of God and for the healing of nations. Spend a few moments in these prayers.
point to invite you to stand as we continue to sing and sing a song about uh, God just giving us his heart, the heart that he has for people, that we would begin um, to be a worker in whatever harvest field that we find ourselves in. But I also just want to remind you of the tables that we have in the back. And so if you would... Uh, want to receive prayer if you know of someone who you'd like to just pray with someone for I invite you to go and do that now as we sing this song together you rise on the lowly the others look away your feet run to the broken your hands are quick to sing A service, what a sermon, that line uh, that, that Mark said, the love of Jesus compels us 
in ways that duty never will. That has been in my head since I heard it Thursday night, and it's been something that I've been thinking on, and, and hopefully you guys carry with you through the week as well. And it's just this idea, right, that because we are known, because Jesus loves us, because of what he has done for us and the love he has for us, we can go into the unknown. We can step in, into unsure places, unsure circumstances, and carry the gospel of Jesus with us. Two really good friends of mine who've, who've done this with their lives as well as anyone that I know. Their names are Mac and Olivia Johnson. And I met them when I was a freshman at Ozark and they were upperclassmen, they lived off campus, and they were way more kind to me than I ever deserved uh, them to be. And they actually moved a couple years ago to Poland to do ministry there with an organization called ProM. And I'm really excited. Uh, we get to join them. Our initiative of the month is church planting. They're church planters in Poland. So all the money uh, that you spend over and beyond the, and, and tip over and beyond the price of the food at the cafe goes uh, to them and goes to ProM and what they are doing. Um, Poland is an interesting place because there's a lot of cultural Catholicism there, a lot of very like cultural um, religion, and it's weird. If you Google it, you can check me. Poland, the parliament voted there to make Jesus king a few years ago. Um, not really sure what that means, and so, but you might hear that and you might think, well, that's a weird. Why are we sending missionaries there? Sounds like everyone. It sounds like they're pretty well covered, um, but uh, in that culture. The, the, the cultural religion that's there is completely devoid of this idea of grace, right? So the concept that Jesus came and died for them so that they could go to heaven and be with Jesus, not of their own merit, but because of faith in Jesus is not only alien to that culture, uh, but people who choose to believe and follow the true gospel of Jesus are um, often ostracized and cut out of their families, out of their communities, out of their whole culture. And I was talking to Mac last week and he said, it's weird because it feels a lot like the first century in which the Bible is written, in which you're just preaching grace to these people and they don't want it. They want the law. Um, and I just want to say that it's only because of people like you, right, who sit in a pew and give a little bit of money um, that people like Mac and Olivia can go and plant churches. And Proem does so much ministry besides just church planting. They do camp ministry. They work with school kids. They have so many mercy ministries, and they just find creative ways to take the love of Jesus uh, with them into the culture. And so if you would like to give today to, to help continue the work of people like Mac and Olivia, we have three ways that you can do that. You can give online, you can give in the app, and then there's also boxes. Um, as you walk out, you'll see offering boxes there. I really can't tell you what a privilege it is to get to talk about the partnership we have with the Johnsons as a church now. Not only uh, is the work they do great, but they're just two of the greatest, kindest people that you could ever meet. Um, and so this week, as we go out, I if you guys would pray for the Johnsons, that would be awesome. And I think it's pretty cool because as we get to step out on mission, um, we're halfway around the world from them, but we are stepping into the harvest field together um, and together working to share the good news of Jesus. So go in the peace of Christ this morning and knowing that you're known and loved by God. We love you guys. You're dismissed.